Hello, uh, morning everyone and welcome to our March webinar. Um, my name's Andy Whitaker, and today when we, well, when we were thinking about putting our 2021 webinar schedule together, we realised that the last case law update session that we ran was actually back in, in February uh, 2019, believe it or not. Um, and that was really driven by the fact that there was such a need last year for so much information and updates about all well, the lockdown rules, furlough, managing workforces remotely um, during a pandemic. Um, and no doubt we'll be looking at those uh, issues again as we move forward, um, as the government um, introduces or implements its uh, reopening roadmap. But we thought everyone loves a case law update, and maybe we would pause now, take a break, and look at some of the interesting uh, employment cases that have been hitting the headlines over the last few months. Um, the courts haven't stopped, the tribunals are still operating, but there is quite a long uh, backlog of cases. Um, and our group's litigation calendar is still quite full as we're continuing to support our clients um, in their uh, uh, dealing with their employment disputes. But one thing's for certain that is that although hearings may um, be predominantly virtual now, um, the number of the cases being brought um, against employers are, are, are no less real as a result of that. So, um, I... Uh, I am really pleased to be joined today um, by the newest member of our team, um, Natalie Wood, who's joined us as a solicitor at the start of this month. So um, welcome, Natalie. Uh, welcome to Boys Turner and also to your first webinar. Thanks, Andy. Good morning, everyone. OK, so uh, without any further ado, let's take a look at some of the recent uh, employment tribunal cases, as well as some of the uh, interesting appeal decisions that have been hitting the headlines. We'll be giving you a steer as to what um, to look out for as well in the next few months as well. Um, and as we go along as well, we'll be pointing out some places where maybe you might want to consider changes to your internal policies, procedures or rules that you might want to look at modifying those to take into account some of these decisions. So lots going on. And without further ado, then let's, um, let's get cracking with that. So the first case that we're going to be talking uh, about today is involving Morrisons um, and a group of the supermarkets employees whose data had been leaked. Now, this is quite a well known case and some of you may, may well remember because we've, we've discussed it before. And this time around, uh, Morrisons were appealing against a decision um, of the Court of Appeal um, as to liability. Now, the facts of this case, as you may remember, um, uh, involved a data breach that had occurred um, due to a rogue employee deliberately leaking uh, personal data of nearly 100,000 colleagues online. The employee brought a claim, um, uh, sorry, the other employees rather brought a claim against the employer on the basis that it should be held vicariously liable for the other employees, the rogue employees actions. And they pursued Morrison's for an alleged breach of the statutory duty under section 44 of the Data Protection Act, a breach of confidence uh, and misuse of private information. The employee responsible for the data breach was a senior auditor who'd recently been through the supermarket's disciplinary procedure and had received a verbal warning uh, from his employer. The trial judge and the Court of Appeal both determined that Morrison's were vicariously liable for his breaches. And that was the basis of this appeal um, that was pursued by Morrison's. It is an interesting case. Um, why did the trial judge and court of appeal in this in this matter hold that the employer was liable for the actions of its employees? Well, both the trial judge and the court of appeal found that the supermarket was vicariously liable for the employee's breach of the statutory duty, as I've mentioned earlier, also for his misuse of private information and his uh, breach of the duty of confidence. So. Vicarious liability um, often arises in an employee-employer relationship, and it essentially means that an employer can be held liable for the actions of its employees when an employee is negligent against a third party in the course of their employment. Um, both the Court of Appeal um, and the trial judge concluded that the individual had been entrusted with the data that he had access to, as his task was to store that data and then to disclose it to third parties from time to time, lawfully it must be said, uh, whilst he did not do what he was authorised to do, so his actions were it's clearly not something that he was required to do under his job description, it was still closely related to the task that he had been asked to perform. 
So the question then before the Supreme Court was whether the employee's actions were so closely connected with the acts that he'd been authorised to do in his lawful job um, that the wrongful disclosure could fairly and properly be regarded as being done by him while acting in the course of his employment. And what did the Supreme Court decide? Well, in this instance, the Supreme Court held that the employee had been engaged in furthering the employer's business when he disclosed the information. However, it also um, it also determined that the employee had been pursuing a personal vendetta due to the disciplinary proceedings and the verbal warnings that he'd received uh, a few months prior. And the Supreme Court therefore held that the employee's conduct was not so closely connected uh, with the acts that he'd been authorised to do as part of his employment, and his actions could not therefore be regarded as being done by him while acting in the ordinary course of his employment. So as a result, Morrison's could not be held liable um, for the employee's conduct. So Andy, what do you think this means for employers? Do you think it's fair to say that this case was fairly fact specific? Um, yes, I do. Um, because cases of vicarious liability, are, like all cases, going to be considered on a case by case basis and look um, specifically at the facts. And in this matter, it was very important that the employee was pursuing that personal vendetta against the employer. Um, his pursuance of vengeance um, <laughs> meant that his uh, actions were not so closely related to the acts that he was authorised to do by his employer, and that accordingly his employer could not be fairly and properly regarded as being liable for them. So while this is a welcome decision for Morrisons in particular and, yeah. and, and employers in general, um, they should be mindful that vicarious liability matters um, are fact specific, that this hasn't um, in any way undermined um, the provisions regarding vicarious liability. Um, you know, it, it's just because of these specific facts and this vendetta that they are able to avoid liability. It's still, however, really important um, to maintain security of personal data that employers hold, remember to ensure compliance with the Data Protection Act, um, remind employees of their obligations under the law, as well as training staff, particularly those who are going to handle and process data on your behalf. Um, it, it's really important and recommended that you do that. Um, data is really valuable, um, and we've seen that other companies have not been as lucky as Morrison's and have faced huge fines for data leaks and breaches uh, of, of this kind. Yeah, all too often. Yeah. Um, so we're now going to move on to a um, case. Um, this is uh, Robinson and um, Department for Work and Pensions. Um, and this is a disability discrimination case. And in this case, the employee worked within the debt management department and her role required for her to use specialist software, which she became unable to use at the end of 2014. And the reason for this is that she developed blurred vision in one of her eyes. A risk assessment was then carried out by her employer and it was recommended that she used a magnification software. However, the magnification software was not suitable because it could cause migraines, the very problem that the employee was suffering from. In around 2016, the employee was moved to another department, this time in a paper-based role, um, and she was paid the same. She lodged a grievance at the same time, and this was upheld on the basis that the claimant had not been provided with a computer that incorporated the adjustments that Occupational Health had recommended in a reasonable time frame and also on the basis that the employer's failure had been detrimental to her health and well-being. The claimant then brought a second grievance and an employment tribunal claim against her employer. And she claimed discrimination arising from disability under section 15 of the Equality Act and in relation to her employer's failure to make reasonable adjustments under section 20. The claim focused on three instances of unfavorable treatment, which included her removal from the debt management department, Secondly, the employer's failure to deal with her grievances in a timely manner. And third, their failure to implement recommended reasonable adjustments. OK, so that was the claim. What did the tribunal and then the EAT decide before it actually got to the Court of Appeal, which is the case that we're speaking about here? So the tribunal found in favour of the claimant's discrimination arising from disability claim. Um, and they did so on the basis that the respondent had failed to deal with her second grievance and appeal in a timely manner. That had um, they'd also failed to protect her from stress, which caused then a detrimental impact to her health. 
And third, it failed to implement occupational health's recommended reasonable adjustments in a timely manner. Interestingly, though, it did not find that the employer had failed to make reasonable adjustments. This was because the employer had exhausted all avenues to enable the claimant to be able to return to her original role until ultimately it was clear that that just wouldn't happen. The Employment Appeal Tribunal disagreed with the tribunal's finding that the claimant had suffered discrimination arising from disability, but agreed with its finding that the employer had not failed to make reasonable adjustments. Okay, so, so far so clear. Um, what did the um, Court of Appeal decide then um, in respect to the EAT's decision? So it upheld the EAT's decision um, and they clarified that attention should be given to the reasons for unfavourable treatment. So basically considering the thought process of the individuals that are making the decisions. And they found that the employment tribunal had failed to take that into account. For example, it had, you know, seen that there was a delay with the employer dealing with the grievance. However, it hadn't considered the thought process behind that, the reason for the delay. And the Court of Appeal couldn't make any finding fact that could establish the delay in responding to the grievance was because of the claimant's disability. Okay, so bearing all that in mind, then, mm -hmm. what do we think employers should take away from this decision? Well, when courts determine treatment of a particular kind, they will examine the thought process of decision makers. So employers should be mindful of that and ensure that all of their staff, in particular those at managerial levels, have been properly trained um, on disability discrimination, as their thought process may later be scrutinised at tribunal. It serves as a reminder, too, that employers shouldn't in delay investigating grievances or managing them and because often that can lead to further escalation of tensions and also I think it serves as another reminder for employers to think of other ways to try and resolve disputes um, you know such as using mediation. Yeah absolutely and I think also it's very difficult to, to prove at a later date what your thought process was. Exactly. You know, you, you can give evidence and say, well, this is what I considered. No, this was definitely what was in my mind. But partly because we're seeing um, so many cases delayed by months, if not years at the moment, because of the backlog in the system. Can you really hand on heart remember specifically what it was that you were thinking about and what factors you took into consideration when making a decision a year, 18 months later? So taking those notes when you're running a meeting confirming what factors you considered what factors you didn't consider you know what what was your rationale for, for for coming to the conclusions that you did is very important and then also recording them in um, whatever your outcome letters might be no one wants to receive a 30 page um, grievance conclusion letter perhaps that might be overplaying it a little bit but certainly giving some clarity as to what factors you considered and why you made the decision I think would be then helpful and assist you in being able to uh, explain what your thought process was when you get to when you get to uh, tribunal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay then so let's move on to our next case uh, and this is a Covid related case. Um, one of the first ones uh, that made it to um, the tribunals and it involved an application for interim relief and a request for reinstatement. Now interim relief applications are very rare. Um, I don't think I have ever personally been involved with one in my 20 odd years of practice. Colleagues have in the team but it, it's not one that I've had to personally deal with um, myself. And in this case we had a claimant who worked for uh, Premier Fruits and uh, due to the impact of the pandemic on um, his employer, he was asked to take a 25% uh, cut um, in his wages, uh, in addition to then taking one week's unpaid leave per month. So many employers were taking these sort of steps this time last year, looking to see what agreements they could potentially reach with their employees about reducing overheads. In response to this um, request, the claimant's uh, trade union brought a grievance on his behalf, stating that the wage reduction had caused him a detriment and that uh, the health and safety of staff was being endangered due to a lack of PPE within the work environment. Um, then in that same month, a staff meeting took place and the claimant wasn't actually attended, uh, invited rather to attend um, the staff meeting. However, the claimant got wind of it and he asked a colleague to uh, record the meeting for him. And on the uh, recording, a manager was heard saying, and um, there's, a, there's a quote from the recording, um, one particular person in, this, in the firm has decided to go to a union 
and dot 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 dot. Uh, you can probably guess um, who the person is as he's not stood in the office at this moment. I'll not be dictated to by a union. If they're not careful, they're going to ruin this country. Not the company, you notice, but the whole country. <laughs> um, so um, a grievance meeting followed uh, where the claimant complained about victimization alleging that he'd been threatened uh, with dismissal uh, for bringing um, a grievance earlier in the month. The grievance wasn't upheld. The claimant appealed that decision, complaining that he'd suffered a detriment on the basis of his trade union membership or activities, specifically that he had been excluded from this staff meeting. Um, that appeal was not upheld and the claimant was subsequently dismissed as he didn't agree to the pay reduction um, that the respondent had requested the employees agree to uh, and they put forward the argument that they weren't able to sustain his salary. So he then subsequently made an application to the tribunal for interim relief and reinstatement. For the sake of um, clarity, interim relief is essentially not waiting for a full tribunal to consider the merits of the uh, dismissal, but um, to ask the tribunal to intervene um, immediately to reinstate the individual pending the actual full hearing of the uh, of the claim. So think of it in terms of almost like an injunction, as you might do pursue if someone was in breach of their restrictive covenants, for example. So it's, it's that sort of early stage relief that you, you might apply for. I think, as you'd said earlier, that interim relief is granted only in quite rare circumstances. So what circumstances did the claimant rely on in this case? Yes, that, that is right. And so um, interim relief, as you can see on the slide, may only be granted in relation to uh, claims um, of automatic unfair dismissal, where they allege that the dismissal itself was for one of the limited grounds um, and that they're likely to be successful in bringing their substantive claim when the tribunal gets round to considering it. So he made his application on the basis of automatic unfair dismissal, as he was required to do, and he alleged that he'd made protected disclosures related to health and safety at work under Section 128 of the Employment Rights Act, or Alternatively, he said that his dismissal was automatically unfair because it was out on the basis of him being a member of a trade union or using trade union services, um, which is uh, protected under Section 152 of the Trade Union and Labour Relations Act. So although the tribunal was not persuaded on the claimant's argument for interim relief on the basis of making a pr protected disclosure, it was persuaded that he'd have a pretty good chance of success in establishing that he was dismissed for being a trade union member or on the basis that he'd engaged in trade union activities. So the tribunal therefore granted him the interim relief that he was searching for. And what was it that made the tribunal come to the conclusion that he would be likely to be successful if he were to bring a claim for automatic unfair dismissal on the basis of his trade union membership or activities? So uh, the tribunal considered this, this likelihood of the dismissal being found to be for those reasons. And the point about an automatic unfair dismissal claim, of course, is that if you can argue it was for that reason, it is therefore unfair that you, you can't justify it. It is simply an automatically unfair dismissal if you're dismissed for that reason. And they took into account um, evidence such as uh, the recording, <clears throat> excuse me, that was taken at the staff meeting where the manager indicated their disdain for trade unions and their feelings about the employee going to the union for help. Um, the fact that the claimant hadn't been invited to that staff meeting and um, uh, and also the dismissal of the employee who'd taken the recording at the team meeting, mm -hmm. which happened just a few days after the meeting itself took place. Um, so, yeah, on the basis of, of that evidence that the, the tribunal um, granted interim relief and, and granted reinstatement pending the uh, pending the full hearing. So what can employers take from this case then? Well, um, this case um, is, is relevant um, right now um, because of decisions that have been made to reduce um, employees' salaries or take other steps to um, mitigate the impact of the pandemic. Now, obviously, um, furlough was introduced and, and that also assisted and some of the steps that might have otherwise been considered uh, were put on the back burner. And you might think that um, this storm has slightly passed but of course, um, as we move out of lockdown and we look towards the potential end of furlough at some stage this year, um, it's still uncertain exactly how quickly and how strongly the economy is going to bounce back. It may be that businesses will still have to consider other steps um, to 
protect their overheads and to protect the the ongoing um, uh, profitability of the businesses. So um, it might be that we'll be considering these sort of steps again. And employers are able to do these sort of things, um, but they need to be mindful of the processes that they're following and also the potential implications of any dismissals that arise. Um, it's also, and this should probably go without saying, I think, uh, important to remember that employers can be held liable if they treat employees um, unfavorably or unfairly because of any trade union membership or activities that they involve uh, that they're involved in. Um, another interesting point as well about this case is that um, the importance of the uh, covert recording um, that took place here. Um, now. We could speak for a, a whole webinar about covert recordings and when they can and they can't be used and what the implications might be of it. But um, I think the general rule is that um, more often than not, if a tribunal is presented with a transcript or a recording itself that was taken covertly, um, they will often listen to it more often than not because they want to know what was said. Um, so, you know, simply because uh, you subsequently discover that someone has covertly recorded a meeting and you, you didn't know that was happening. That doesn't mean that that evidence is going to be, um, uh, it is not able to be heard before the tribunal. So important to, to always handle any meetings that you conduct um, professionally um, to avoid anything that you say um, potentially being recorded and then played back to you at a later date. Okay. Right, so next case then. Yeah, so this next case is Gallagher and Abellio ScotRail. Um, this one is quite an unusual one. It involved an employee who'd worked for her employer for a number of years. Uh, she began reporting into her supervisor in around 2011, a relationship which then started to deteriorate a, a few years later. Um, the reason for this is that the employer was denied a pay rise and it just went sort of downhill from there. The employee was then added to an on-call rota in 2016 which is something that she had been openly adverse to. The employee then went on a period of six sick leave, which then spanned into the tail end of 2016. And then in early 2017, there were various return to work meetings, which were held between the employee and her supervisor, which ultimately failed to resolve any issues between them. And there had been a breakdown in trust between the employee and her supervisor, which was causing a disruptive working environment. Given that the claimant's role was critical to the business, she was very senior, so was her manager, it was felt that there needed to be an immediate change and the employee had already indicated that she didn't want to stay in the role for the long term. So can, alternative positions were considered for the employee, um, but to no end, ultimately there wasn't anything else for her within the business. And um, the only alternative was for her to be dismissed due to loss of trust and confidence. So the reason for her dismissal was some other substantial reason, which was the irretrievable breakdown of the working relationship with her employer. Interestingly, though, no formal process was followed in the lead up to her dismissal, as it was not felt that following a process would actually help to manage the situation at all. And the, the, the employee then lodged a tribunal claim. OK, so um, it's not unusual to see um, claims arise where there's been a breakdown in relationship of a, of a, of a management team and SOSA, SOSA, some other substantial reason, is mm. often used to justify a dismissal in those circumstances where there's no obvious conduct or capability issue. So what did the tribunal decide here? Um, so the this decision made it to the Employment Appeal Tribunal and they upheld the decision of the earlier one. And they determined that the relationship between the claimant and her supervisor had broken down. And as two new senior employees, this re really did present a huge barrier to develop delivering the objectives of the business. And the EAT therefore found that the claimant had been dismissed due to an irretrievable breakdown in trust and confidence, rather than for performance or conduct related issues. And because of that, it meant that the ACAS code of practice didn't apply. So ultimately, the EAT upheld that any appeal process would have been futile and that the decision to dismiss was substantively and procedurally fair. Yeah, so that's quite an unusual finding, isn't it? I, I think, I mean, mm. I'm not saying it, I, I disagree with it, but it's it's quite unusual where you've got a dismissal where there's been essentially no process at all and the tribunals uh, are, are happy with that. Absolutely, because normally when no process has been or no formal process has been followed prior to a dismissal, 
that decision to dismiss would normally be outside the band of reasonable responses and would be unfair. So employees should usually be afforded the opportunity to discuss the decision to dismiss them and also to appeal that decision. And it is really, really rare for a situation where an employer is deemed to be acting within the band of reasonable responses when they haven't actually followed those procedures. Yeah, and I, obviously I understand that the ACAS code wouldn't apply because the ACAS code on on disciplinaries is exactly that. You know, if it's, if it's a disciplinary matter, there is a, an expectation that you would follow the code. And I can see why this isn't a disciplinary matter, so it didn't apply. Um, but just the, the laws of natural justice, you know, the expectation that you would know the um, uh, know the issues, if you like, and be given an opportunity to respond to them, um, would mean that you would ordinarily expect there to be some sort of process. But it's 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 interesting that the tribunal found that because essentially they found it would be futile, they um, that they were happy to conclude that the tribunal was fair. So so what do you think employers should take from this case then? Well, as a matter of good practice, employers should, wherever possible, try and adopt formal procedures. But where those procedures aren't possible due to a breakdown in trust and confidence, there is some leeway with the requirement to adopt such procedures where the dismissal is as a result of the breakdown in trust and confidence. And importantly, where having a formal process would would be futile. Um, so I think this is really a useful case for employers to refer to in the event that there is a breakdown in trust and confidence. And particularly with a senior employee, there's sort of the business is going through sort of a bit of a tricky spot. Um, and the relationship between the senior individuals is causing damage to the business. Um, I, th I think it is very useful for employers to keep note of. Um, but also, again, um, something we mentioned earlier about the, the importance of mediation and coaching to help diffuse tensions. And I think, you know, this, this could be something employers would want to think about in such a circumstance. Yeah, and it's possible that that might help um, resolve the issues between the senior management team, um, and that's often preferable. But it's mm. this is an interesting case um, to look at in terms of what happens if if that simply isn't going to work, and there has been this this breakdown in the in the relationship between those senior managers. Okay, so let's move on to the next case, and um, the. Um, issue of uh, investigation of genuine belief and the reasonableness of the investigations that are carried out are the uh, foundations of uh, any um, gross misconduct case, a conduct dismissal. Um, and this was established in the uh, well-known case of BHS and Birchill, which is a, sort of the building block, if you like, for, 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 for conduct dismissals. And in order to fairly dismiss in a a conduct circumstance you need to show as an employer that you have a genuine belief in the employee's misconduct and having you you have maintained that belief having carried out as much of an investigation as was reasonable in the particular circumstances so this case highlights um, how this can be affected where there's a police investigation into matters which are also being investigated by the employer um, the facts involved a teacher who was being investigated by the police for having indecent images of children uh, on their computer. Uh, the teacher in question had a clean disciplinary record um, prior to this and had been employed by the respondents for 20 years at the time of the investigation. He claimed that his son and his son's friend also had access to the computer and that it could have been them um, who downloaded the images. The difficult situation here, and particularly uh, with you know the, the police investigation ongoing and and the nature of the individual's job. Yeah, absolutely, a, a really really tough one for the employer to to to, to manage. Um, what the employer decided to do to begin with was that they they suspended the uh, claimant from work, um, and he was charged um, by the police for possessing indecent images of children. However, following the police investigation. Uh, the claimant wasn't prosecuted. Um, the school then conducted its own investigation into the allegations and um, that investigation concluded that there was insufficient evidence to point to the claimant himself having uh, downloaded the images. However, despite not being able to come to the conclusion as to whether or not he did or he didn't download the images, 
um, the claimant was still dismissed in any event due to the reputational damage um, that was caused um, to the school and the breakdown in trust and confidence. Um, and as a result of that dismissal, the employee then brought a claim. So, um, Natalie, what did the tribunal decide on this one? Well, I remember reading about this one and the tribunal found the dismissal was fair and the Employment Appeal tri Tribunal then found that it wasn't. Yeah, that's right. So um, the EAT referred back to the school's investigation. And don't, uh, let's remember that the uh, school's investigation found that there was insufficient evidence to support the allegation that the claimant had downloaded the images in question. With that being the case, the respondents, the, the school lacked the requisite reasonable suspicion um, of the belief of that he had done this. You know, they concluded themselves that they couldn't conclude that he had downloaded them himself. Um, and the EAT noted that there is a general rule in law that facts need to be um, proven and that the fact that something may or may not have happened can't be relied on as proof. Um, let's have a look at what else um, the uh, the EAT said, because obviously they also had to consider the reputational risk issue too. Yeah. What so? Uh, sorry. What, what did the EAT decide then in relation to the respondents' reliance on reputational risk? Yes. Yeah, so um, they again they upheld the claimant's appeal. And they did this because they said the, the school had uh, had not given the claimant notice that he was being dismissed due to reputational damage, stating that the employee, of course, needs to know what the grounds of complaint are being made against them are in advance of any meeting to give them a proper opportunity to defend themselves. Uh, in this regard, the claimant had been invited to a disciplinary hearing and uh, at the, at the hearing, it outlined the complaint against him, but it didn't cite reputational damage as a complaint to be addressed at the disciplinary hearing itself. Um, the appeal judge also um, pointed out that um, whilst reputational damage was was clearly and legitimately a concern for the respondents, given the nature of their their, their responsibilities for children, the concern of reputational damage essentially subsided when it became clear that the claimant wasn't going to be prosecuted. So on that basis, the, the, the claimant's appeal was upheld and his dismissal was found to be unfair. Do you think it's fair to say that this case is a reminder to employers to ensure that they notify employees of all potential grounds on which they could be dismissed? Yeah, it's, it's that old, it's that old um, principle, isn't it, of making sure that when we invite people to disciplinary meetings, and indeed, if we dismiss when we write the dismissal letter, that we are clear exactly what it is that they are being accused of having done and what is the reason for the, making the decision that you have. Um, it's a good idea to refer to policies or to the contract of employment and pick out the specific things, um, if you're able to identify them in a con in a contract or a policy, and say, these are the things that we think you have done. And, that, and these are the grounds or these are the charges that we want you to answer and be as specific as you can. Uh, because if you don't, as we saw here, it, it may, uh, obviously the, the fact that he was um, ultimately not prosecuted may have undermined their argument about reputational risk mm. anyway, reputational damage anyway. But the fact that they didn't say that was one of the issues that they were having to consider meant that he well, didn't know that in advance um, and uh, didn't have any time to properly respond to that before a decision was made. So, um, yeah, important, very important to be clear uh, in drafting your, your correspondence. So moving on then, uh, next one, one that I suspect many people may have heard of. Yep, the Uber case. Um, this, this one was a really um, important decision in relation to employment status and the gig economy. The judgment has been long awaited um, with the Supreme Court hearing the matter back in July 2020. So Uber drivers have been successful at every stage of the legal process so far in arguing that they're workers and not self-employed. And the success did not stop at the Supreme Court, where it was held that Uber drivers are 
workers. Yes, it's fair to say this wasn't a huge surprise. Um, <laughs> certainly, we've seen yeah, the, the current of these decisions all um, uh, travelling in one direction, really, about um, uh, the establishment of worker status in all kinds of different circumstances. But um, for uh, for this particular case, what were the what were the key issues that the Supreme Court considered when they came to their decision? Um, well, they looked into the fact that the drivers could not set their own fares. Um, they also considered that Uber could terminate drivers if they received persistently poor ratings. Um, also, that drivers could be penalised for rejecting too many rides, and also that drivers had no say in contract terms. Okay, so as I said, this was um, hotly anticipated. Um, what do we think this means for Uber and its workers? Well, as workers, they would be then entitled to receive basic worker rights. Uh, just so for the example, national minimum wage, rest breaks and paid annual leave. So obviously there's a cost associated there for Uber. Um, interestingly too, the Supreme Court held that Uber has to consider its drivers as workers from the time they log onto the app until the time they log off and not just workers for the time that they're driving um, with a passenger in the car. So for Uber, there could be some unwelcome tax liability associated with this decision also, as Uber has long maintained that it's a booking agent rather than a transportation provider. So which meant that it didn't have to pay 20% VAT on fares. So the decision definitely muddies the water of Uber simply being a booking agent. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, I think this may be our last case. Yes, so um, this is another um, pretty recent decision from the uh, Supreme Court, and it's hugely important for employers who use sleep in workers. So this one involved an individual who worked for Mencap as a care support worker, um, who provided support to uh, two men who needed uh, round the clock uh, care. So the, um, the support workers, including the claimants, um, were organized into a day shift and a night shift. And during the night shift, the support worker had no specific task. It wasn't anything in particular that they were required to do, but they were obliged to stay at the house and listen out for any issues that might arise during the night and then provide assistance where it might be required. Then during a 16 month period that the support worker was, was providing this service, um, they only had to intervene during sleeping hours um, six times in that 16 month period. So the need for her to uh, act during these nighttime hours certainly wasn't a frequent thing. Um, for a nine hour sleep uh, in shift, the support worker received 29 pounds and five pence. Um, there was another individual, meanwhile, who worked as an on-call night care assistant in a residential care home, and they were paid £90 a week and lived in a paid-for staff flat. And similarly, the on-call care assistant was required to be in the flat during the nighttime hours and respond to any requests for assistance. So both the support worker and the on-call care assistant brought claims in relation to their entitlement to receive the national minimum wage during their night shifts so they're oh, no. saying you know you know they they, they they should be paid not just uh, when they're doing something but for the totality of their shift I remember the uh, tribunal's decision on this one they found in favor of the support worker but not the on-call night care assistant yeah that's right so um that is that is the de decision that the tribunal made and surprise surprise both men cap and the on-call night care assistant who was unsuccessful appealed to the EAT in respect of their respective uh, outcomes. Um, MENCAP won its appeal against the tribunal's finding in favour of the support worker and it also successfully defended the appeal um, from the on-call night care assistant. So they were able to resist the argument mm -hmm. that they needed to pay national minimum wage for the totality of the night shifts for them. So the, the thread of appeals uh, then followed uh, and it made its way all the way up to the uh, Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court found in favour of MENCAP in respect to both appeals. Um, in coming to this decision, the Supreme Court um, 
observed that um, careful consideration needs to be given to the arrangement between an employer and a worker. For example, uh, in these sort of circumstances, for example, where the worker is required during their um, during their sleep in shift, you know, where they've got to be, what they've got to do, um, uh, and, and, and where they sleep when they're not working. Um, it concluded that where the only requirement of a worker is that they respond to emergency calls, then the worker's time in those hours should not be included in the national minimum wage calculation unless the worker actually answers an emergency call during that period. So essentially the period of time during their sleeping shifts when the work, worker is awake and making emergency calls, yes, they get national minimum wage for that. They would be entitled to it for that period. But for the rest of their sleeping shift, no, they're not. This really was a long awaited decision. It'd be a huge sigh of relief, I'm sure, to many care providing employers um, that workers are only going to receive national uh, minimum wage when they are awake and available to work, given that a decision in the alternative would have meant increased staffing costs on an ongoing basis, as well as claims for back pay for previous six years with an estimated bill. I think it's around 400 million. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's winners and losers, as there is in, in all in all claims um, and uh, you can understand why uh, the workers in this instance might feel hard done by um, but from the um, particular employer's perspective and also from the care sector's perspective at a time when we do have a bit of a funding crisis in the uh, in the in the particular sector this is perhaps um, you know a, a decision that is uh, that has been welcomed um, by those uh, businesses Okay, so we promised that we would look ahead. So let's do that. So Nathalie, tell me, so what, what is there, uh, tell me a little bit about this Costal case then. Yeah, so this is arguably one of the most anticipated trade union cases for a long time. And the Supreme Court will hear it in May. And essentially it's about whether employers can offer incentives to workers to influence their relationships with unions. And the background of this case is that Costal, who's the employer, um, wrote to their employees on two occasions. The first time, it threatened employees that their Christmas bonus would be revoked. And the other time, it threatened employees with dismissal um, if they didn't agree to a pay deal that their union had rejected. So both the tribunal and the EAT declared that the actions of the employer were, were unlawful. The Court of Appeal, however, had a different idea and found in favour of the company. They said that the legislative provisions in question, which was section 145B of TOLCRA, was to prevent employers from looking, away, looking to move away from the collective bargaining permanently. Whereas in this case, what the employer was trying to do was just resolve one issue. Yeah, that, that is interesting, isn't it? Because we, we know in general terms, you, you know, you you may find yourself in difficulties if you are offering inducements to individuals um, in these sort of circumstances. Um, but this an interesting distinction that the Court of Appeal has 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 reached here or, 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 or has established between um, the, the mischief of the legislation, if you like, to try and stop employers from disengaging and not being involved in collective bargaining at all versus a one-off specific issue that the employer was looking to resolve. So um, we will keep our eyes and ears open yeah. for that. I can't imagine we're going to have a decision on it for quite some time, bearing in mind <laughs> the hearing is in May. Uh, but obviously, um, for everyone who signs up to our regular updates, um, you know, we will report on this uh, as and when the decision comes out, uh, as we will um, all other interesting cases that arise from time to time. So that brings us to an end of our formal presentation. Oh, have I gone too far? There you go. Questions. Um, we do have time to answer some questions uh, if anybody has any. Um, I'm going to close that because you don't want to see that on my screen. Um, I think uh, Kerry, I think from our marketing team is, is monitoring the questions. Is, is there any there, Kerry, for us? Hi, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, yes, we do have one question. Um, I think we've got some, some time for. So um, Ashley Spencer has asked, on the first Morrison case, if you, were uh, if you were contracting with a supplier, is there any way to make sure in the contract you have contract cover for any confidentiality or DP, or DP breach in that situation? Um, well, speaking not as a commercial lawyer, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm delving slightly into the uh, realms that I'm not entirely comfortable with. But, but in short, yes, you, you can, you can of course enter into um, uh, uh, contractual provisions um, where you can seek to um, 
place a penalty upon the um, third party provider should they act in breach in this particular way and should they be liable if they if they put you to uh, if they if their actions cause you to suffer a loss then yes you, you can look to have them indemnify you against the costs you incur um, as I said, it's it's not necessarily my my field of expertise in 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 commercial contract drafting, but yes, it's certainly something that you can look at. Whether or not you're able to agree that with a party or not will often depend upon the commercial realities of the relationship that exists. You know, it might be that you'll find your providers are very reluctant to do that, um, but yeah, it will come down to a matter of negotiation. I think. Thank you, Andrew. That was our only question. Okay, well, with that being the case, um, we'd just like to, to round off. We've we've kept you for about 45 minutes, so that's more or less bang on. Um, just to say thank you all very much for uh, for listening and joining us today. Um, we will we do have a listen again facility, so um, you will get a copy of this recording. You are able to share it with your colleagues. Um, we, as ever, have a, a busy schedule of uh, events coming up, mainly online for the time being, for obvious reasons. Um, but um, please do feel free to sign up to any mailing list that you have uh, haven't already signed up to. Visit us on our website or follow us on uh, LinkedIn or our other um, sites. We also have podcasts that we um, produce from time to time on a number of matters, not just employment law. So um, yeah, do follow us where you would uh, like and we'll try and keep you up to date with uh, all developments. Um, so I'd just like to say a big thank you from me, Natalie. Thank you very much for your time as well. I hope the first webinar wasn't too painful. And so um, I, th <laughs> I think my internet just froze, apologies. Well, we got through almost to the end without any technical hitches. So thank you everyone for attending uh, today and we hope to see you all again soon. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks.